Well, hello and good morning. And welcome to Evangelical United Church of Christ. My name is Craig Bilkey. I am the director of Christian Education, Youth Ministry, and Communication here at the church. It is so wonderful to be with you this morning. Pastor Todd is on his last day of vacation uh, for this calendar year. He's taking it off so that way he can prepare and get uh, a little bit of extra Z's, if you will, in preparation for the season of preparation, which is known as Advent, which will start up here at the end of this month. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a first-time guest with us or if you've been here forever. We would love to get your attendance to register that you've been here. Uh, we do that through the friendship pads or the pew pads or the things that are uh, somewhere inside of the pew that you just write your name down on. Uh, first-time guests, it's a great way for us to connect with you and get to know you. Also, for uh, those who have been here forever, it's a way for us to register your attendance just to make sure that you've been here. Um, and then also you can put any prayer requests or anything else that you might have on there. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're here in this sanctuary or if you're watching via our Facebook live stream or our YouTube channel or listening. Uh, this will be delayed. But WGEL, we are so excited and happy that you are here for, uh, here for worship today. Let us now join together in our opening and gathering hymn. No matter where we are along life's journey, we have journeyed here together to worship from the north and the south, from the east and the west, and let us now rise in body or spirit as you are able for us to join our hearts and our minds in this responsive call to worship. Unless our God watches over the city, those who watch stand guard in vain. The widow who gives her last coin, and Naomi and Ruth, who are lifelong companions for each other, remind us of the risk we are free to take with confidence that God is present through times of plenty and times of want all along our journey through life. Let us pray together. Gracious Holy God, we join together in this holy, sacred space and time so that we might be able to worship and to praise and to learn more about how you are acting in our lives. Fill our hearts, O oh God, with the Holy Spirit and fill this sanctuary as we are preparing to fill this sanctuary with song. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
have a seat. Uh, I invite now all those who are young at age and those who are young at heart to come join me up here on the chancel steps. Uh, if we don't have any of those who are young at age, I'm going to do something that uh, the confirmands ain't going to like. But confirmands, y'all can even get a service project if you come on up. So any confirmand who would be brave enough to come up here for children's moment, come on up. You can fill out your service sheet, and I'll give you a service hour for it. For those of y'all who might not know, our confirmands, we have eight confirmation uh, students who are going through the rigorous process of confirmation. And that is loud. Y'all can have a seat because I'm going to sit down with y'all. And the fun thing is with confirmation is that there's requirements. You're required to be at 20 uh, worship services, fill out worship service sheets, and then also they're required to do 20 hours of service here in the church. And that can be participating in worship, like doing greeting or maybe even this. So, uh, Lane, you can come up too, or not. You can stay back there too. Uh, has it been a little while since y'all have been up here for, for this? Yeah, okay, well, I mean, does it feel a little awkward, a little weird? Yeah, well, that's okay. Uh, the reason why it's okay is because I'm going to invite you uh, to a party. Do you know what today is? It's, what, what's the day? Well, it's, uh, no, not, it's Confirmation Sunday. Uh, it is uh, November the 7th, right? Uh, it's Sunday, and at 12 o'clock, the Dallas Cowboys play the Denver Broncos. It's a very, very important high liturgical day for at least myself and even Pastor Todd, our consistory president, Pam Schmidt. We are all Cowboy fans. So it is not only America's team and not only God's team, but also EV's team are the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, but I'm inviting y'all to come on over to my house, if y'all would so like. Uh, you and your families, y'all can come over. Uh, it's at 1048 Sanders Drive, St. Louis, Missouri, 63126. Um, it's only about 45 minutes away, um, but y'all have to uh, come and bring something, okay? What you have to bring is you have to bring $2. You have $2.00. You don't even have to bring it. You have to give it to me now. <laughs> Do you have $2 on you right now? You don't have $2 on you right now. I'm very sad and, and disappointed because I guess y'all can't come if you don't have $2 unless we can come to an agreement that you might have something else that you could give me or that you could bring. Uh, is there anything else that you could bring to this party besides $2? You could bring some food. Okay, well, uh, so what kind of food are you going to bring? I need to know so that way I can plan. Buffalo dip. buffalo dip. I love buffalo chicken dip. Yeah. Are you bringing celery, chips, chips? Okay. No celery though. It's pretty good on celery. Okay. So just chips. Fair. We got that. So what are you bringing? Hmm. Fruit. fruit. What kind of fruit? Because I have fruit at home, so I want to make sure that we're not going to double up here. Watermelon. That is something I do not have. So that would be awesome if you bring some watermelon, buffalo dip. Lenny, what are you bringing? Cheese and crackers. So I have rich crackers and I have cheese, so I don't need that. What else do you have? <laughs> cheese it? I have goldfish. Those are kind of like cheese it's, but uh, I'll let you off if you bring the Tabasco cheese it's. Okay? All right, you have to bring the Tabasco cheese it's and then you can come. The green Tabasco as well. Uh, very, very specific. Um, so y'all are going to bring something to the party. I initially told you that you had to bring $2, but through you didn't have $2 to give me right now, so we agreed that you're going to bring something else to the party. Do you think that might have another word for it? Like whenever you bring something, uh, a gift, if you will, uh, or uh, is there another word? It starts with an O. We do it during church a lot. Offering. It's an offering. That's exactly right. You, whenever you go to a party, a lot of times you take something with you, especially like if it's a potluck. You might bring something along, something to share. Uh, I made, or rather my wife Katie Jo made, these Rice Krispie pinwheels that we took yesterday to the neighborhood potluck, and they call them crack wheels because you can't have just one. And they're, they're delicious. You'll try them eventually, I promise, because that's what I bring to every single potluck. But we bring offerings. 
in our Bible story today that we're going to be reading from Mark, we're going to hear about a widow's offering. And there's something that you're supposed to bring, and you're supposed to drop it in every single time you enter in to the temple. And, of course, it's money, but it's a very, very special certain kind of money. And there's people that are outside called money changers that will exchange the money that you have to bring. The great thing is you can come here to EVUCC, you can go to churches, and you can sometimes bring money, and it can be any denomination, but if you don't have that, you can just bring the thing that you always have with you, and that is yourself. That's the most important offering that you can bring, even though having watermelon, even though having buffalo dip with chips, and having some green Tabasco Cheez-Its would be amazing to have at the Dallas Cowboy uh, victory party, hopefully today, that'll be at around ending at like three-ish uh, if they play quickly. But the most important thing is, if y'all come, is to come as you are and to come and offer just uh, your presence. That's the most important thing. So we do that not only whenever we go to parties, but also whenever we are coming here to church, we offer ourselves. Will you pray with me? Gracious, holy God, thank you for the time that you have given to us uh, to be able to share with these children, with these students even, what it means to be able to offer ourselves to you in your holy presence. Bless these students and children, O oh God, as we, your church, prepare them for discipleship and we lead them along their faith path and faith journey. Allow for us to be good stewards of them and the resources and blessings that they bring and attune our ears, O oh God, to listen to these students and to these children so that way we might be able to grow into the future. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you all so very much. Don't forget your uh, service hour slip. Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. And this is where Jesus denounces the scribes. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes, who like to walk around in long robes, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have the best seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greatest con condemnation. Now the widow's offering. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. I'm going to stand here for a little bit. A couple points of order. You might notice uh, things look a little bit different from what I traditionally wear whenever I come up and lead worship. Um, I have a hole in my sole of my boots, and so I'm looking for a cobbler. If anybody knows of a cobbler, that would be amazing, uh, because that's uh, beyond a lost or dying art. So since I couldn't wear my cowboy boots, I wasn't going to wear my jeans, and since I didn't wear my jeans, I wasn't going to wear my coat. Plus, there is a little bit of like a practical reason. We'll be celebrating communion today as we celebrate communion. In the jacket, I just can't quite lift my arms up all the way because of a little bit of weight gain uh, these past 18 months. And so that has caused my jacket to either shrink or for me to grow, and I just can't quite lift up my arms the way that I'm supposed to. So that is be that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is inside of your sermon, inside of your sermon, inside of your uh, worship bulletin, you might notice uh, some blank spaces uh, that have been included. Those are sermon notes. Uh, just to help out, kind of, it keeps me on track. It also hopefully will allow for you to uh, make some notes or for you to write down your grocery list, gives you a little bit of space uh, to do whatever it is that you might need or want to do. 
And I've talked about this with a few people, but there are a few things that you do not talk about in polite company and you should not talk about from the pulpit. Does anybody know what those three things are by chance? Number one is politics, absolutely. Number two, money, that is exactly right. Number three, I'm going to see if anybody says it, sex. It's a good thing I'm not going to be preaching from the pulpit. I can guarantee that we are going to talk about two of those three things, though, today. The three things that we talked about, of those two, we're going to be talking about sex and we're going to be talking about money. Do you know that the Bible is filled with all three of those things? Filled with it. It talks in exhaustion about especially money. Uh, whenever you read through the Old Testament mainly, and also parts of the New Testament, there are loads of sexual innuendos and romance books even written in the whole, in the whole, uh, the whole book of Song of Solomon is a romance book about it. Uh, and then also whenever you look in some of Paul's epistles, there's even like what you should or shouldn't do maybe, uh, which are, can be interpreted in various ways. And then even politics. Jesus himself talks a lot about politics. I'm not talking about the final one today, thankfully, but we are going to be bringing up uh, something that might be a little controversial. The other thing that uh, I changed up today is my insert inspirational sermon title has changed to insert confrontational sermon title here. Feel free to insert whatever it is that you would like there. We did not read this text, but it's a quick story that I would like to share that comes from the book of Ruth. Naomi, who is Ruth's mother-in-law, is uh, Naomi is getting advanced in age. She's getting a little bit up there. And as she's getting up there, she is not able to take care of her daughter-in-law, Ruth, like she would like to. Um, and she's actually worried about not only Ruth's well-being as she ages, but she's also worried about her own well-being and safekeeping. Because back in these times, in the post-exilic, meaning after the exile, after the Babylonian exile, uh, it is a hard time to be a widow, especially um, in society. Because as a widow, you don't have a husband or a man that's able to care for you. And all of Naomi's uh, male relatives have either deserted or have died. So Naomi has been taking care of Ruth. Somehow they have been able to get through it. And now she has presented, Naomi has presented to Ruth, to do something that's a little scandalous. She says, do you see that nice looking man over there? His name is Boaz. He's working out in the field and harvesting. You should go and make some niceties with him. Maybe bat those pretty eyes and uh, lay at his feet. Whenever you hear lay at his feet and to uncover, it sounds exactly like what you think it is. And Ruth does as Naomi uh, has instructed. And Boaz eventually uh, comes around, and they end up getting married. Uh, whenever they get married, uh, she is able to then fold in to, into the care uh, Naomi and, as they say, they live happily ever after. Now, what the ancient Hebrews would have been hearing, and what like people in Jesus' time would have been hearing, is that here is this widow woman uh, that has been going through life and been able to provide for herself, but no longer is able to do such a thing. But there's one thing that she has not been able to not get rid of, and that is her faith. That is her understanding that God has been there with her and with her family throughout it all. Even during the Babylonian exile, uh, the ancient Israelites would have understood and known that God was with them. They knew that they were being put into uh, bondage, they were being put into hard trials and tribulations, but yet they wrote about all of these things, and they put them into their sacred text, and they tell these stories over and over and over again. And they tell those stories a lot of times around the dinner table. We will tell a story around uh, the dinner table here in just a little while. We call it Holy Communion, or uh, the Great Feast, and whenever we tell that story, it's to remind us of, you know, what is our faith tradition, well, we have also adopted the faith traditions of our brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith. 
And we bring those with us. We bring all of what they have learned along with us as well. But we know that faith makes things possible, but not easy, right? There's a scripture that uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is uh, to say that we can do everything, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be a simple wish which is uh, asked and granted, like getting three wishes from a genie, and God just poof gives it to us. But rather, if we ask for patience, does God give us patience, or does God give us opportunities to be patient? If we ask uh, God for devotion, does God give us devotion, or does God give us opportunities to be devout and to use our faith whenever we ask for strength? Does God give us strength? Whenever we ask for slimming, does God give us um, a diet? Or does God say, hey, go run and work out at the gym like everybody else should do? God will give us possibilities to exercise our faith, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be very easy. This is a prime example whenever we look at uh, Ruth and Boaz. Ruth didn't necessarily want to go and be with this man, but yet she understood that she was being told by somebody who uh, had strong faith and was um, looking out also for herself and uh, for, well, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And she said, that is fine. I will go and do these things because there is somebody who has been led by the Spirit and who has deep faith in God that this is what we need to go do. It's not to trivialize it and to say that a widow has to go off and sell herself doesn't mean that a young woman has to go and give herself to a man to be taken care of. The ancient Israelites wouldn't have heard that. Instead, they would have heard that we need to make sure that we're taking care of the least of these. And now let's fast forward a few centuries, almost a millennia, into our scripture that we read today in the widow's offering. Jesus is sitting. He had just kind of given a strong retort to the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, the scribes are an interesting religious bunch because they are the intermediaries. They are the ones who are interpreting the text and they are interpreting the faith, the Jewish faith, and they are telling that to their congregation and they are also the intermediary between the people, they're part of the congregation, to the Roman government. They are the ones that are the middleman, if you will. It's interesting to note that Jesus gives these three very, very distinct things, and he warns his disciples about them. Number one, whenever he tells that the scribes are desiring for prominence, rather than a selfless service. They wear these super long robes and they wear these really tall hats. They dress and adorn themselves so that way they can be picked out of a crowd really easily to set themselves apart. Now we do this even in our own tradition. As I stand before you, I realize that I am doing what? I am wearing a robe, that I am wearing, uh, adorning myself with jewelry. I have on a cross. Uh, that was given to me by one of the first churches that I served. The robe that I wear is from my parents whenever I started attending seminary. It has great meaning and understanding to myself, but yet the only reason why y'all now understand it is because I have told you. Has anybody ever heard about why um, a family will cut off the ends of a turkey leg whenever they put it into the roaster? Well, I'll tell you, of course. Uh, so... There's a family, and uh, the mother is getting a little bit older, and so she finally invites her daughter into the kitchen so that way she can see how the turkey is prepared. And as she is preparing it, she's describing everything that she's doing. You know, I put salt inside, a little bit of lemon, stuff the bird with all of the wonderful aromatics, and then salt on the outside, even a stick of butter on the outside, yada, 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 lobster bisque. Well, then... She cuts off the ends of the leg and puts it in and just shoves it in the oven. And her daughter's like, wait, mom, why did you do that? And she goes, well, I really don't know. That's just the way that my mother has always done it. So then she went and she asked her mother and she's like, mom, why do you cut the ends off the turkey leg? And her mom goes, well, that was just the way that my mom had always done it. And of course, it went on and on and on. Well, luckily, 
the third matriarch of the family was even still around, and they were able to ask the third matriarch, why is it that we cut off the ends of the turkey leg before we put it into the oven? And the third matriarch said, well, that's simple, because it just wouldn't fit in the pan otherwise. <laughs> we do things a lot of times just because that's the way that they've always been done. Whenever we explain why we do tradition, why we do things a certain way, we can then pass on why the meaning of that tradition is so important to us and allow for the next generation to make that meaning be important as well. So Jesus warns the disciples about the self-prominence and the selfless service is number one. Number two, the desire for reverence and acknowledgement from others rather than seeking to promote the good of others through humble service. Jesus warns the disciples against not seeking to do whatever it is that you do out of simple, humble service for another, but rather to promote yourself, to give yourself a higher class and a higher authority. Again, to set apart. One of the things that we do in the Christian tradition is we say we ordain, which literally means to set aside. Whenever we ordain a clergy person, we are setting that clergy person aside or setting them even up, lifting them up a little bit higher in our classes and in what it is in our faith. The reason why we do that is because there is a lot of study, there is a lot of prayer, there is a lot of meaning that goes behind a time of ordination. And whenever, you, if you've ever been to what is called an ecclesiastical council, you will know that it is not something that is for the faint of heart. An ecclesiastical council is where uh, the clergy person offers himself and anybody in the Illinois South Conference, for instance, can go and ask any question about faith, religion, about uh, the person's background. You can ask anything that you would ever like. You do have to be a delegate of the Illinois South Conference, but whenever you are sitting among even 10, 20, 100 people that can ask you anything. And it's not necessarily a easy question like, what are angels, which is angels are, uh, evangelical catechism is failing me right now, uh, but they try to say, you know, angels are holy entities which are mediaries between God and us, or that they're spirits. And, or they could be hard questions like, can you explain to me the uh, meaning of communion? Now, that might be something that takes a little bit of time and understanding. But they present themselves, these candidates for ordination, to be in humble service and not to acknowledge themselves or to ask for greater reverence for themselves. And finally, Jesus warns the disciples that um, the scribes are attempting to use their position for self-gain and self-advancement. They're trying to use their position for self-gain and self-advancement. Now, self-gain and self-advancement, that becomes hard in our own society, doesn't it? To try to persevere and try to make, you know, a living you do have to worry about whatever it is that you're doing. You have to worry about your job because there's somebody else who is gunning for that job and looking to do it better than you and maybe even cheaper than you. But then Jesus reminds his disciples about the true faith is being in a good relationship to God and to one's neighbor with love, honor, and reverence. Love, honor, and reverence are the three things that Jesus says that we need to be in good relation with. Whenever I uh, was working at Webster Hills United Methodist Church, there was uh, the Christian ed director, Christy Walker, came to me frantically because she needed to find a Sunday school teacher. I was the director of communications at the time, so I didn't know what to do, but I had some uh, knowledge to be able to help out, and she needed to find somebody to take over this class. And as we were walking from about one end of the building clear over to the other side of the building. Whenever we walked by, I saw a little squirrel that was outside, eating an acorn, just running around burrowing, uh, trying to find and store stuff for winter. 
And I say, you know, Christy, let's look at this little squirrel out here. I took a minute to do a, uh, a teaching moment, if you will. Look at that squirrel that's out there. You know, in our scripture, we are told that the birds of the air and the grass of the field, they don't worry about where their water is going to come from or where their next meal is going to come from. And then Jesus says, you are created in the image of God. Don't you think that God would care for you much more than caring for the grass and the birds? And as she was sitting there, she said, I can't believe that you're trying to do this right now. I have, we have to go take care of this problem, and you're sitting here trying to do scripture. And I was like, well, don't you see that we're worrying about something that's a little smaller in the grand scheme of things. I know that we have somebody who's in the class taking care of the kids. They're being loved. They're being nurtured. They might not be able to have their lesson taught because a Sunday school teacher isn't there, but I can guarantee you that everything's going to be okay. The sun will rise in the east and set in the west just like it does every single day. And it's not necessarily because we're going to try to find a Sunday school teacher or not have a Sunday school teacher, but it's because that's the way that God is just going to take care of everything and we can just go about our normal way of life. In Isaiah, Isaiah 40, which we will read during the Christmas time, we are told these ancient stories, or these ancient words, even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Faith is what we have, essentially, whenever we come into this world, and faith is all that we have whenever we exit this world and enter into life eternal. The widow took two pennies, essentially, and dropped them into the offering plate at the synagogue. After dropping in those two things, even though there were people who were walking by dropping in much more, uh, much larger amounts of money, Jesus said that she is the one who has given all. And it can be hard because we, again, want to persevere. We want to self-preserve. It's a biological instinct for us to try to preserve ourself, preserve what it is that we have. Now, there's a difference between preservation and conservation. There is a conservationist named Aldo Leopold, and he talked about the wolves. The wolves are something that, if you aren't familiar, were running rampant around the western United States. There were tons of wolves. As the wolves were running rampant, they realized that there were less and less game animals, less deer, less elk. And they thought that it was because the wolves were taking all of the young and all the herds were diminishing, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Aldo Leopold instead said, no, we need to hold on to all those wolves and we need to make sure that we have a good balance that we are able to balance uh, the ecosystem, and we need to conserve the resources that we have, these natural resources, and be able to use them and harvest well, instead of getting rid of all the wolves, which will then give us an overabundance of deer and an overabundance of elk, and then again, what happens? We have less grazing fields, and we have less resources for those herds to be able to eat. We need to make sure that we have the balance of having a predator to prey ratio. And before that, we were in a preservation mode of, concert, of uh, trying to keep all of our natural resources. We were trying to just extend them to make them last as long as they could, and eventually knowing that they would go away. Instead of understanding that as the conservation goes, that we will have ups and downs, we will have twos and fro's, we will have giving and taking. The widow, I think, gave us a great explanation of that. She gave all that she had to live with for the glory of God and gave it to the synagogue, hoping that even though the people who are sitting there that are going to spend that money are going to be spending it wisely, she gave everything knowing that she would get something later on and that she was a great child of God to be able to love and to have enough faith to be able to give freely and to give everything that she had. 
It's a hard thing to be able to do that. But like we said at the beginning, faith makes things all possible, but not easy. Amen. As God has given to us, allow for us to freely give back to God with the receiving of our morning gifts and offerings. join with me in prayer. Gracious holy God, we offer you here our gifts and offerings. We ask for you to take them and to multiply them to bring about the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. Multiply them, O oh God, in overabundance and also bless all of those who have given out of their deepest hearts and desires for the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please be seated.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and it is good that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to the Lord our God. We are told that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he told his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you and for the world. Every time you take of this, do so in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he poured. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for the world. Every time you take of this, do so in remembrance of me. And so, in obeying the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, your people, O God, offer you this bread and this cup, recalling the life of Jesus Christ, recalling the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, and recalling his resurrection and ascension. Bless and sanctify us your holy, with your Holy Spirit, both us and these gifts of bread and wine, that in this holy communion we may be made one with God, with Jesus, and with us. And may we remain faithful members of Jesus' body in this church until we feast with him in your heavenly kingdom. Let us join our hearts and our minds for a time of prayer. Holy God, we, your people, have come here today from north, south, east, and west. We have gathered, O oh God, for worship and for praise and to gather around this table. As we gather, God, we recognize that there are things which we have done and things which we have left done, undone, things that we have said and things that we have left unsaid, which have separated us from you, from each other, and from ourselves. God, we confess our sins and we lift them up to you. We ask for you to forgive our sins and for you to make us a holy people that continues to desire relationship with you and to be in right relationship with each other. God, we pray for those in our community who are hurting and ailing. We pray for those who are heavy on our minds and on our hearts, those who are listed in our prayer list, and those who have been left off of our prayer list, especially one of our We Care Daycare teachers, Miss Taylor. As she enters into this time, O oh God, be with her, be with her family. Allow for them to feel your Holy Spirit and the presence of peace to know that you will carry them through this hard time. And also let them know, O oh God, that we will be there along the way with them as well. We pray, God, for all the medical staff and personnel who continue to answer the call of need. We pray for our first responders. We pray for those who stay awake at night so that way we can lay our heads comfortably on our pillows and sleep through the night. We pray for our country men and women, O oh God, who have served us both stateside and abroad, facing fears unimaginable so that we might be able to be free. God, we pray all of these things and we lift them up during this time of silence, the things which we have said and the things that weigh heavy on our hearts and remain unsaid. God, we offer them during this time now. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the ta- this table is open to all who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There is no prerequisite of uh, confirmation or baptism. So long as you desire to have a deeper relationship with God, this table is open to you. Come, for all things have been made ready. You will notice that you were given a communion cup whenever you entered in. There's a top foil with a little bread. It looks like a chiclet on it. So you can just open that at this time. And the bread which we have broken and has been given to you represents the body of Christ. Take and eat. The cup which has been poured out for you and for the world, take and drink. Let us give thanks to God. Gracious God, we have been reminded of Jesus' sacrificial love for us as we have shared this meal together and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have received his life in us. May we make our thanks visible by serving you and each other. Send us out in the power of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I would like to call your attention to a few announcements which have been listed in your weekly word. First, thank you to Ken Bivens, who gave uh, in, to the radio ministry in honor of all military veterans. If you would like to sponsor a radio ministry, uh, you can, uh, 2021 is booked up, but we are uh, reserving for 2022. Uh, make sure to contact the church office for that. Uh, Fee 10,000 is still going on out there, which is going to benefit the NICE Foundation, which is a foundation here in Highland, Illinois. You can read some more about that in your weekly word. Grief Share, which is a wonderful ministry, uh, is going to be having a Surviving the Holidays uh, seminar. It's a two-hour seminar on November 17th from 6.30 until 8.30. Uh, just contact the office to reserve your spot, really just to let us know you're going to be there. Also, Totenfest, which is a celebration for all of those saints which have passed on to life eternal, will be on November 21st during worship. If uh, you have not received your letter, you should be receiving it soon. Uh, for anybody who has had a loved one passed, uh, if you ha- did not get one, though, please do contact us at the church office, so that way we can uh, make sure that'll be uh, going on well. And last but not least, we do have Hanging of the Greens, which is a wonderful celebration for anybody who uh, thinks that Thanksgiving is a time you should start listening to Christmas music or decorating for Christmas. Uh, You are incorrect. The time to do it is Hanging of the Greens. So come get your Christmas on and Uh, be full of Christmas cheer by hanging the greens here in the church. Uh, The worship board will be kind of leading it, but we need those to, you know, climb up the ladders and to hang the garland and et cetera, et cetera. So many hands make for light work. That'll be on the 21st as well, right after worship. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Yes, Miss Alicia. Journey to the Star, that one is listed in there. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, If you want to still decorate even earlier, uh, Journey to the Star is doing it what time to what time? After one time. Awesome. So, Saturday, you can even get your church, uh, your Christmas decorating on early. All right, well, that is uh, what we have for announcements. Let us conclude our worship with music.
from spirit calm our hearts can roam our spirits long to be made whole let inward love guide every deed by this we Please turn and face the benediction window. Do so in Christian love. Support the weak. Uplift the faint-hearted. Render unto no one evil for evil. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Love and serve God in all things. And now, shalom to you. The peace of God be with you. The peace which this world cannot give. The peace which this world cannot take away.